course, I'm very uh, happy to be here in London, and I worry a little bit about uh, the very fact that those two uh, symposia, the one in Rhode Island and the one here in London, uh, follow so close upon each other, and the faces that are particular, the ones up on the gallery, uh, are all the same. Um, what, however, um, really uh, has happened between um, uh, to me since Rhode Island's uh, positions in architecture is that I did something the last week which I never <laughs> did in my life and maybe will never do again. I was invited to go sailing in the Greek islands. And so actually I'm not coming from the, east, from the west, but I'm coming uh, from, the, from, from the east here. And when you sail in the Greek islands, and we sailed the beautiful, actually we flew the British flag. We were on a boat that came out of London. Uh, if you battle uh, waves that are 12 feet high and winds that are very strong, um, architectural symposia uh, far away and not very important. Uh, so I was a little bit afraid uh, how to set myself into the right frame of mind again uh, coming into London yesterday. I think I start with the slides uh, right away. Uh, I left uh, Mykonos, uh, I left Mykonos uh, four, uh, five days ago and perhaps when I came in last night and I heard the grand finale of Conrad Waxman uh, and his uh, uh, beautiful commitment to the future as he sees it, uh, I was perhaps reminded um, of the opening statement of Barry, uh, of Barry Wolf at this year's uh, Aspen Design Conference. Uh, Barry Wolf is the executive director of CBS Documentaries in New York, and he started off by saying, I'm 53 years old, and I have seen the past, and it's working. Uh, coming from Greek, uh, one feels very strongly about having seen the past, uh, in Santorini, the people are still talking about the infamous uh, eruption in 1521 before Christ that destroyed the Minoan civilization, as you know, in Crete. 3,500 years, at least in geological times, is not very much. Here, on the other hand, we are celebrating, or you are celebrating events that took place uh, 20 years ago and 10 years ago. Well, 20 years ago, I was still a student of architecture. And 10 years ago, I was just beginning to make my first design, so to speak. It was a time when some significant changes, at least in my opinion, did occur and took place. It was the time when Buckminster Fuller uh, began to stamp the lecture halls of the world and would tell anybody who dare, wanted to listen to him that the great highway systems, highway systems in America will be, um, be finished just in time to be turned over into roller skating rinks. Uh, it was also the time when uh, I had arrived in America and at the time I was very interested in transportation systems and the, the effect of transportation networks upon architecture. Uh, it had occurred to me that architecture um, mostly occurred at the interchanges of different loops of transportations. Uh, the person, the average person, person that leaves his house in the morning uh, in suburban America through the, through the kitchen door into the garage, finds himself in his car driving to town, and then he finds himself in the elevator loop, or, and at lunchtime he is again in the elevator loop. So in other words, uh, there are continuous loops of transportations, and it's only at the interchanges where people sort of interchange from one network of transportation into another that architecture activities actually occur. 
1965, I was working uh, on a competition for an airport in Berlin, uh, for Berlin, and, 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 and yes, a, a competition for a new airport, Berlin Temple. And while I was working on it, it occurred to me that um, while I had previously dealt with uh, land, uh, uh, with land-connected transportation networks, the moment you deal with uh, uh, airborne networks, something quite interesting had happened. Namely, so much of the hardware that is involved in transportation networks has become. Um, uh, was no, lo was no longer part of the, of the hardware, so to speak. In other words, the, uh, the so-called uh, uh, holding patterns, the, uh, uh, the, the, the routings of aircraft in, in the air, the equivalent of the highway systems, uh, all were uh, uh, strategic, um, uh, uh, were mapped strategically. However, they, were, they no longer needed to be built. In other words, they were uh, imaginary. And particularly, I was intrigued by uh, uh, one part of it, which is, this, which is the, the holding patterns, or how they, they are called, the uh, uh, so-called waiting rooms. And what you see here uh, is actually my first drawing uh, of those uh, phenomena, uh, which is the holding patterns or the uh, waiting rooms over New York City. And uh, they are color-coded uh, uh, for the various uh, New York airports. And there are two interesting um, properties that are worth mentioning. Uh, one is that uh, those, those holding patterns uphold uh, definitions of spaces, at least in terms of in, in engineering terms. That is, an aircraft that flies into these spaces uh, is um, dealt with in the same matter or in the same way as, for instance, we would be dealt with in a space like this. Uh, the people talk about the ceiling, the people talk about the floor, uh, the people talk about walls. And an aircraft that would not precisely uh, be located in the center of such an imaginary waiting room uh, is, of course, instructed to move to the right, to the left, or up and down. Uh, the second property, uh, and that intrigued me even much more, uh, is the fact that these abstract spaces that exist above our metropolises only exist if activated by an aircraft. And I thought that it would be, if it indeed would be possible to translate such a model into the reality, into, into architectural reality. In other words, that if it would be indeed possible to require human involvement for an architectural space uh, to exist. Uh, that that w would be something worthwhile investigating. But let me just briefly show you uh, what I did in 10 years or uh, 12 years ago. Uh, this was our um, airport entry, which I did together with uh, Raymond Abraham. I will rush through those drawings uh, rather quickly. Uh, as I said before, I had arrived in America, and I was very interested in, in the impact of transportation networks upon architecture. Um, actually, it was uh, Hans Hollein who uh, asked me in 1964, I was in Rome at the time, to come to uh, Vienna to the Gallery uh, St. Stephen and to prepare a lecture, and I think it was in 1964, on the work of the European um, architects in, to, in whose work he and I and others in Vienna were interested in the time. And I prepared at that time a set of slides, which I since then had never shown. I showed it for the first time uh, several weeks ago in Aspen at the design conference. Uh, the models, the, uh, the images that I thought uh, were very influential in the work that was done uh, 10 years ago. And of course, uh, you all remember Courage and James Bond. And Michael Webb, whose project that you are probably are very familiar with of 1958, which perhaps was the forerunner uh, of all the work, or much of the work that you see during this conference here. 
But I was very intrigued, and this was 19 now, 1968, I was very intrigued with this model of those imaginary uh, holding patterns ab above our metropolises. And my second drawing is the one to the right, which was a reconstruction uh, of what those invisible structures would look like. Um, and as I said before, there were structures that upheld engineering parameters of space, except they were invisible and their skin was imaginary. And I was consequently in 1969 invited by the director of the Museum of Modern Art in Stockholm to come to Stockholm. I met him in a bar in the, west, in the east side in New York and to try to translate uh, the concept of an imaginary room uh, into the context of an art gallery. And I must confess that much of my troubles began at that day. Uh, I was in Providence uh, at the time and I began to uh, conceive for I could not uh, think of any other means as to employ a laser beam and uh, quite similar to the model uh, uh, that I have shown you before, I tried to create an imaginary room, a room basically uh, in which the moment you entered into the space there was nothing in it, it was an empty space, a void and very much like the aircraft that penetrates the, the holding patterns and in so doing activates the holding patterns, uh, a human being had to penetrate into that neutral space and then uh, an imaginary room was activated and you could walk into the room and you could experience the room and when you left the room uh, sort of the non-descriptive uh, situation uh, was restored. The imaginary room uh, vanished. It was of course a terribly abstract and very unsatisfactory uh, model. Uh, several other smaller models followed uh, as I came back. Uh, I was uh, asked to make some more proposals. Uh, this for instance here is a study we did in, in the School of Architecture at MIT which is the, the model for an imaginary ceiling. Uh, what you see here is the model for a large installation uh, that was at the, at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington in 1970. Uh, the idea was, this, was more or less the same, perhaps uh, slightly more sophisticated. After Stockholm, I realized that in order to transform the notion of a space, you do not really have to transform the entire space, but if you take a significant element of the space, like for instance the ceiling, and you transform the ceiling, um, you receive uh, a similar effect. And the idea here was that uh, various kinds of ceilings, dropped ceilings, were hung into an exhibition space and in so doing, uh, hopefully, um, the human response to that space could be altered. Um, one of the early works by Venturis, uh, here uh, a, a renovation of a church in Philadelphia, uh, very much from at the same time, sort of um, shows some affinity. Uh, I very quickly abandoned uh, the laser beam simply because um, as, I, as it was for me nothing but a working model, I quickly learned and understood its limitations and it, its inability to ever uh, uh, sort of be possible to translate it back into the realm of architectural reality. However, I also realized that perhaps one of the greater potentials available today uh, is within the confines of holography. And what I show you here are really the first uh, very naive proposals uh, uh, that I made in 1970 with holographic projections. Uh, the one to the right is called, uh, um, uh, it's the proposal for a museum of architecture. Uh, it's from a series which is called Vanishing New York. Uh, it's, of course, what you see here is uh, uh, Penn Central Station, uh, which was, uh, 
uh, Dakin Town at the time, and it occurred to me that uh, holography uh, would be uh, a rather fine medium uh, to employ for, for instance, to, 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 to show architectural buildings that no longer exist, and one could show them full scale uh, over, the de over the deserts. Uh, the, the, the one to the left is called the, the Statue of Liberty on loan uh, over South Africa. Um, 1971, uh, quite a number of proposals followed, uh, all of which um, are not to be taken too seriously. Uh, they are, uh, among other things, uh, much too large, and it is rather impossible uh, to build such uh, projection holograms. 1971, I came to the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, and we had just received the grant uh, to study the river uh, uh, in the city and uh, for those of you that know Boston uh, know the Charles River which is a very beautiful uh, body of water and I uh, couldn't get myself to uh, build anything onto uh, the edges of the river so I made those proposals for large-scale holograms floating icebergs uh, there was quite there are a number of associations possible. Of course, it gets very cold in Boston in the winter time. Uh, a floating iceberg that uh, uh, floats weightlessly between Boston and Cambridge uh, would be something that uh, um, uh, bears some relationship to the reality. Of course, its size, the fact that it's transparent, translucent, um, uh, 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 quickly identifies it uh, or identifies its own reality. Uh, I saw at the time that uh, such images uh, in the dreary uh, winter nights in Boston uh, would be something cheerful uh, and would uh, delight some people. Uh, the problem I had at the time was that all these projects that are very easy to be uh, done on a piece of paper uh, were impossible to materialize uh, and so I felt a great urge to uh, uh, bring down the scale of the work uh, to, to a scope that I could actually build. And I fell back uh, upon a very primitive uh, uh, model, a uh, demonstration model that I found in the, uh, in the physics department of the university, which you can uh, see here. It's an invention of the uh, 18th century that states that a concave mirror will simply um, reproduce an image or an object at twice the focal length of such a mirror. And what you see here is, of course, is a light bulb that uh, seemingly exists uh, above this black box, but it's, it exists only uh, in, a, in a sort of frontal view. Uh, if you see the, the same, uh, if you see the same picture from an angle, you don't see it. Uh, in other words, it is an optical illusion. And based upon that principle, I made some small pieces uh, uh, that I still have uh, in my studio today uh, for myself, really, to demonstrate the principle. And what you see here uh, is the first one. And it is really very similar to, uh, it's exactly uh, the same principle as the light bulb. It's called uh, uh, Nymphenburg II, and it is a floating cloud that floats uh, uh, 20 inches in front of the mirror uh, and above that white uh, metal uh, structure. Uh, the, uh, the slides don't really show the, uh, the three-dimensionality, but in reality, uh, the effect of that cloud-like uh, element uh, floating uh, in space is quite, uh, is quite accurate. Uh, the cloud itself uh, is not the best cloud in the world. Actually, I need to give credit for it to my wife. Um, um, everybody thought that my own cloud looked like a potato. I made a second one uh, thereafter in which I not only showed the, the illusionary object, but I juxtaposed it with the, uh, I juxtaposed it with the, uh, with the real object. Uh, and of course, this is something that perhaps brings me um, uh, uh, to a central theme of my work. Um, the, the realization uh, that we have come to live in a world uh, in which 
uh, there exist different realities. The reality of our physical presence, the reality of images, the reality of, uh, of concepts. We have come to live in a time where those realities have become interchangeable, a matter of choice. At this point, uh, I like to tell a story that happened some five or six years ago in Texas, and it is the story of, um, uh, of the first holdup of a remote-controlled uh, drive-in bank. In a remote-controlled drive-in bank, you do your financial transaction um, a considerable distance away uh, from the bank building itself, and the transaction is, 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 is executed via uh, a cable connection and a video set. And one day, uh, a young teller who operated uh, such a remote-controlled drive-in bank um, uh, was held up. Uh, a, a gun was pointed into his screen, and unfortunately, this young man surrendered his cash holdings. And uh, the story was considered funny, uh, and uh, the United Press uh, cabled it around the world. But the point here is that the, 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 the story is not so funny at all, because for that young man who sits behind that screen from 9 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, that screen has long become or has transcended into his reality. This is his reality. That is his world. And the, the feelings, for instance, one can imagine uh, that he would have towards a young lady that would uh, once a week come to deposit her paycheck uh, is not like any other more conventional encounter. So we have this two or the three or four different realities uh, in which we live today. And I ha hasten to say at this point that, of course, these new realities, the realities of images, the reality of concepts, do not threaten uh, the reality that we know best, namely, to, namely the reality of our physical existence. Uh, they are merely, in my opinion, new tools. They are tools uh, uh, given to us, given to the designer, uh, to the architect, uh, to the artist, um, to expand. It is, as one of my critics said, um, it's like a, a piano player that switches from a piano with one keyboard to a piano uh, that has two or more. In my own personal uh, search for uh, or explorations, I always uh, attempted, it was important for me to attempt to bring this idea, so that the notions or the concepts uh, back into the architectural reality, to the past of my knowledge, I have to say. And I show you here uh, some of those at attempts. Uh, to the left uh, is a proposal I made several years ago, uh, which is for uh, a small um, headquarters for a small corporation uh, in Massachusetts. And it occurred to me that, uh, of course, an architect that has to deal with any architectural task uh, has, in principle, addressed himself to two basic domains. On one hand, you have the, uh, the functional domain. A building has to function. A, bu a building has to serve. And yet, at the same time, there are, is the domain that one could call just for the uh, for the sake of distinction, uh, the symbolic domain, um, the and it is also quite clear that, of course, the, the ratio between those different domains differs from, building, from t building types to building types. It is quite, you probably will agree with me that uh, if you consider a church, uh, perhaps the, um, the, the symbolic domains are, are, are more important than the uh, uh, functional domains on the other side. If you think of a hospital, of a complicated hospital, uh, uh, the contrary probably holds too. And so I thought for the first time one could actually separate these two domains and re-delegate them to the different sets of realities. And my proposal was then a building uh, that was sunken into the, into the surroundings, it was sunken into the, into the landscape. Obviously, uh, there are ecological considerations uh, uh, involved, uh, a, minimum, a minimal 
intervention in the landscape was desirable so that the building itself, that, that corporate building, uh, was not visible. Uh, and then the, the corporate image, that second part for um, uh, a small office buildings, at least in America, that is considered important, then was given to the other reality, uh, namely, uh, to, to the notion of, of a holograph that then, that which can uh, float weightlessly, uh, majestically, uh, elusive, transparent um, uh, over the building itself. And I don't know if the, the story of the, um, has come to England, what happened to the simple of NBC, uh, the, the, uh, one of the three networks in the United States. Um, uh, well, if any such problems would befall a corporation, uh, there are some advantages to such a non-physical uh, simple. Uh, to the right, there is a proposal that actually this was uh, my entry into the uh, competition which was held, I believe, in 1971 uh, in Paris, the uh, Plateau Beaubourg competition that uh, some of you probably entered as well. And uh, again, it's an entry that I did together with Raymond Abraham. And our proposal, uh, again, uh, holds to some of the ideas uh, uh, that I have outlined on the left. Uh, the building itself um, was inserted into a very, uh, 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 in, into a very old and, and very homogeneous uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, Plateau Beaubourg in Paris. And there were cer certain, several things that we uh, wanted to observe. First of all, uh, we, ab above all, we, uh, well, the program called for a new museum of art uh, and a major art reference library. And the museum of art is the trunk that points towards the sky and the, muse uh, and the library is sunken underground. That the ground level is somewhat in the center. And by organizing, those two major components the way we did, we created an arena, a stage in which art can occur. Uh, one of the things that we thought uh, impossible to resolve is to foresee what art will be like in five or ten years hence. And we wanted to create a stage, an arena, a setting for, for art to, uh, to happen and to occur. And you can see all the uh, paraphernalia, perhaps r reminiscent of a stage design here, uh, into which art can uh, be inserted. And equally important then, we declared the, the back of the building a uh, pub, uh, public space. We wanted to give the, the back of the building uh, back to the people uh, uh, of the neighborhood. So we made that, as you can see, uh, we made it a public uh, terrace. People could walk up onto the building and a new uh, Plateau Popurg, uh was created on top. Uh, we were one of the uh, many second prize winners in this competition. Uh, Uh, more recently, um, I have made uh, some new proposals, uh, still dealing with, with uh, holographic, uh, or with the com combination of, uh, of what I call uh, elements of, of the reality, the physical reality, and the reality of images, which is uh, the hologram. And what you see here is the proposal for, uh, it's called the Himmelbett. Uh, um, I'm using my native um, uh, German word Himmel, which means heaven. We use, and you use the word canopy bed, uh, we use the word he heavenly bed. And uh, uh, that is something that I um, wanted to maintain as a young boy in Austria. I had actually a lovely uh, Himmel bed. Uh, and so I wanted to recreate it. One of the things uh, uh, I quickly learned is that uh, the best results perhaps can be uh, obtained if you combine the two realities. In other words, the, um, it is very important to have, for instance, the, the reality of an image not in isolation but in context with uh, um, 
um, the reality that we know. And I really learned that um, from that very small uh, model that I found in the physics department, uh, whereby the light bulb itself, so the physiolution, but the, the socket to the light bulb is real. Uh, for those of you who perhaps would be more interested in, in, in the feasibility of, of making larger scale holographs, uh, this is totally in the realm, so to speak, of reality. Uh, if you look very careful, uh, the, 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 the insert, the, the, the heaven, it consists of uh, 12 plates. Each of those plates is 18 by 24 inches, which is the uh, which is the largest uh, commercially produced uh, is the largest commercially put produced holographic plate uh, available on the market uh, in Europe as well as in Japan and in America, and so the total uh, volume or the total surface here is then six by six foot. A more ambitious project uh, that is still on the drawing board. Uh, is this one here, uh, which uh, may be uh, hopefully realized. It's the proposal for um, um, a high fashion design uh, uh, studio um, in New York City. And in, in this case, I wonder if I can improve on the... Uh, what you have here is, is um, it's called walking into the walking into the sky, and uh, the proposal here calls for it's it's a show place, uh, a show pl an individual show place for high fashion designs. Uh, the the floor itself will be uh, or is intended to be shiny uh, marble, uh, green marble, and then you have those walls. Uh, that uh, the three walls, which are holographic walls, and what is projected beyond is the uh, uh, very much the images or the notion uh, that you have when you fly in an airplane. All of you have uh, uh, seen those beautiful cloud formations from the airplane, and uh, it's something that I think uh, not just myself, but many people I know of have always dreamed to sort of uh, bring back into uh, uh, into, the, into the reality of our built forms, of our built constructs. Uh, and so the, the notion here is, of course, of a jet set. Uh, you have the beautiful, uh, the, 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 the beautiful clothes uh, being shown uh, in backdrop of uh, the sky. I show you now uh, a project that actually was my uh, contribution or that was my entry to um, which wasn't really a competition but uh, uh, a request to come up in Boston or out or the architects in Boston to come up with a proposal for the bicentennial in, in of the United States uh, again it, it was sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington uh, again it had to deal with uh, uh, um, this is a structure that uh, was not only to commemorate the, uh, the bicentennial, but uh, that at the same time had a, a social uh, impact upon the city. And since I had studied so for quite some time the river, the Charles River, um, uh, in, in Boston, I uh, decided to make a new proposal for Harvard Bridge. Harvard Bridge uh, is an old bridge, now 99 years old, and at that time I did not know uh, that uh, it will be reconstructed. It was only revealed uh, some six months ago that the city, uh, the Metropolitan District Commission, actually is, is considering to, to rebuilding uh, the bridge. Uh, Harvard Bridge, for those of you who are not familiar, runs across the Charles River um, in the lower Charles Basin, to the bottom you have Boston, in the upper part uh, of the slide you have um, uh, Cambridge. And uh, Boston is not unlike uh, most American cities. It has at one side uh, the grandiose, uh, the, the scale uh, that is made to be seen from, from, a, from a moving car. In other words, if you were to come to visit me and I would like to impress you, I would take you along the rides 
uh, Star Wars Drive or Memorial Drive, and we would show, we would, we would look across the river uh, onto the skylines. Uh, this is very much part, I would, uh, I would suspect, of most American cities. Yet at the same time, uh, Boston uh, is so privileged, uh, uh, like several other American cities, of course, uh, to have also, in addition to that, that very beautiful and very remarkable small scale. And what you see here to the, to the left is a detail of one of the bridges further down, the Longfellow Bridge, which is a very beautiful uh, bridge, the, the detail of the stonework, and I'm juxtaposing it here uh, with the uh, rather well-known sun tile at the Ponte Vecchio in Florence. And all this perhaps already begins to point to the fact that I took the Ponte Vecchio as the model uh, for my new bridge proposal. I thought that um, I have no doubt I consider um, uh, the, the, the place of Harvard Bridge one of the most beautiful urban landscapes intact, at least of those parts of America that I have seen myself. Uh, the, the sun sets in all of New England are very beautiful. You have here the sunset uh, taking from the bridge towards MIT uh, in Cambridge and uh, here again it's Florence. Uh, so I made a proposal that took into account the, 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 the idea of the Bon de Vecchio and also uh, the cable there in Paris, uh, namely uh, the um, the arrival of activity. I'm quite conscious of the fact that, for instance, as a child in Austria, uh, we have the old bathhouses, the white tiles, and uh, uh, it always was very exciting to me as, as you approach on a hot summer day uh, those bathhouses and you have the flickering of the water long before you can see the water. And the same principle is in effect here. And at night, uh, into those uh, uh, mirrors, I had uh, inserted at strategic points diffraction gratings, and those um, at night would bounce back the colors of the spectrum. And it was all quite calculated. The model does not accurately show it. Uh, the colors of the spectrum would drown the, the edges of the bridge uh, in such a way. Um, I have a stick here. As you can see, this is the main deck here, and, and of course, here would be the, the activities that need the cover also uh, if you want to have the passage in the winter time. But during the summertime, uh, you have uh, this portions of the bridge where you'll be, be outside and in the open, and there are cutway, catwalks attached, uh, particularly for the summertime to which those floats are attached for the young people uh, to spend some time. And these parts were trounced by uh, the colors of the spectrum, uh, very much the notion of a midsummer night dream. Uh, this, of course, does not show it to you, but uh, I, we spent considerable time uh, at Ponte Vecchio. This is Ponte Vecchio, but even here uh, in the stucco-clad uh, arches of, of the Ponte Vecchio, you have the flickering of the water, you have the reflections of the Arno, uh, which is below. I'm coming to my, to the end, I have very few slides still to show. Uh, this, perhaps, for those of you uh, who are students among yourselves, um, this is a very modest and very small little factory or laboratory that we now have, or that I have at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, a small box, if you wish, in which we do some experimenting uh, with uh, imaginary rooms and imaginary features, uh, components rather than rooms. And um, it all is a small and uh, painstakingly slow process. Um, results seem to come only in very small meshes. These are my last two slides. Um, of course, you remember uh, Walt Disney, well-respected piano player, imaginary piano player at the Haunted Mansion in Orlando, Florida. Uh, 
by uh, the, the New York artist who held uh, an exhibition at the Architecture League, I think it was in 1970, uh, called Pretend Airplane. I have I am pre preoccupied, I have worked sort of in the realm what you may consider uh, non-physical spaces. Um, I'm interested in, in, in it perhaps because um, I do think that eventually uh, we will move towards a situation in architecture where uh, in addition to the buildings that we will continue to build, uh, we will have uh, features elements of imaginary natures, and we already have them, and this was clearly pointed out to me in Rhode Island, and uh, of course I know about it, but in a larger degree than we had it until now, uh, so that perhaps we will move away from what still might be considered an archaic situation in architecture where we still built uh, buildings uh, for, for one function at a time. Uh, also this, of course, uh, has changed already. Those of you who uh, know quite well the situation in New York, I have several friends uh, whose spaces uh, have for quite some time uh, become adaptable um, to be all kind of things. They are apartments from five in the evening to next morning and then they be turned into our offices. Often they are different people, like a mother who uses, the, who uses it as her office and her son or her uh, children who use it as an apartment at night. And at the, at the switch of the fingertip, so to speak, uh, changes uh, um, do occur. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, I want to maintain that yes, we uh, have learned to live in a world where there are different realities and as a consequence of this perhaps that the notion um, the, uh, the, the notion that we have upheld for a long time uh, the notion or the concept of space where that uh, prescribes space, space as a virgin as a virginal uh, crystalline uh, uh, white painted space uh, um, uh, can no longer be upheld, uh, that perhaps we are aiming and looking at a more complex and a more uh, uh, complicated uh, notion of space. Thank you very much.